All right. Keep a finger here in Hebrews 11. Put a bookmarker there. And I want you just to, to, while I'm talking here, turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be spending almost the entire night in Hebrews chapter 11, but I'm going to be going um, over Matthew 6 a little bit more um, recent than that. So, obviously, Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. I mean, the whole chapter just talks about all these great men in the past that, that, that had great faith, Abraham, Moses, David, you know, and it goes on and on and talks about all these different things. And what I want to be preaching about tonight is the title of my sermon is Living by Faith. Now, it's, it's, there's so many things I love about this subject. Obviously, we, need, you know, we know that our salvation, our eternal life is a free gift given to us as a result of us just putting our faith in Jesus Christ putting our faith in that finished work, in the blood of Jesus Christ, that's what gets us saved. But see, that's not where our life starts. That's where our life really begins. I mean, that's where our eternal life really begins, is with that new birth, with that new creature being born. And what, one of the things I love about this is that that is how our life starts, and that's how our life ought to continue. And what I mean by that is not just, you know, like, like, yes, we need to trust Christ with our soul and trust him that he's, he's our savior to be saved. But the faith that we need to have should go beyond just the saving faith that you need to, to being a faith that's going to dictate how you live your life basically for the rest of your life and the actions that you're going to take. I mean, at least until the point to where we're actually living and, and seeing God face to face. You know, because at that point, I don't know that you can call it faith any longer. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So in order to have faith, it's something that we can't see. It's, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, we're hoping for. And hope, see, people use the word hope today as in there's like some doubt there. But the hope in the Bible has no doubt in it at all. It's just called hope because we haven't received it yet. If that makes sense. I mean, it's just something that's like, well, it's out there. It's, it's a thing that's not seen. We know that we're saved. We know that there's going to be a resurrection of our body, but it calls that, you know, the hope. We have, we have the hope of that resurrection, and it's not at all insinuating any type of doubt. We know it's going to happen, but we, it hasn't happened yet. So we're still waiting for it. There's still this time going by that it's a hope. It's not, it hasn't happened. And what I love this is faith is the substance. So faith is that thing that is hoped for. It's, 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 uh, descri you know, faith is described as being that substance. It's also described as being the evidence of things not seen. We don't see Jesus Christ. You know, people are always trying to tell you, not people always, but like usually atheists and stuff like that, they want to have you prove and give you, you know, like lay it out and like here's my proof that God is real and here's my proof that Jesus is and stuff. But the Bible says, you know what the evidence of that, of that is? Is our faith. The fact that we put our faith in Christ, our faith that, that is in, in Jesus, is the evidence that Jesus is real. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. That's what the Bible says, I believe it. But um, going beyond that saving faith, we ought to let faith influence us and and we really ought to be making all of our decisions based on that faith we need to be walking and that's why we're, we're going to be spending most of the time in hebrews 11 is because that's where the best examples are given about the faith that people had now when we talk about you know taking a step of faith or people talk about leap a leap of faith or um just anything they do is, well, I'm just taking it up by faith. A lot of people throw that term around and they're not really using it properly or they're not really understanding what's involved and what God expects of us when we do walk by faith and when we do live by faith. Example, okay? Someone that just says, uh, well, I just have faith that, that God's going to provide for me because, and look, it's written in the Bible, right? We can believe that to be true, but under certain conditions, right? It's, it's not just like, well, I'm God's child, and God's just not going to let me go hungry, but like you're not doing anything, and you're sitting on your rear end, and you're just playing video games all day, and you're, not, you know, like, and you're doing absolutely nothing, and you just say, well, I'm just taking it by faith. 
That's foolishness. Okay, that is not the type of faith that I'm talking about because the faith literally has to come from God's word and from what he actually says. Right? It's not faith. In, so so we, we can have, we, you can have faith in whatever you want, but we need to be living a faith of the Bible and what God said because that's what it boils down to. People could be acting on faith in all kinds of different areas. You know, people get real superstitious about stuff and they, and they, they make decisions based on some faith. But those are going to be foolish decisions if they're not based on faith coming literally from God's word. And the faith is something that, that God will say to us. So like promises that are made, we have to accept those promises by faith. You know, the biggest one, of course, being our eternal life, that is something that we accept by faith. We say, you know what? God's going to hold us into the deal even though we can't see him, even though we, we, you know, we haven't gotten to that point yet. We just know that he's going to give that to us. We know that that is secure and that's sure. And we take that by faith. But there's many other things besides our salvation that, that God makes promises on and, and says that he will take care of and, and that we don't have to, you know, be concerned or worry about those things. I'll give you an example of this. So like letting faith influence your decision making. When I knew that I was going to start a church, when I decided, yeah, you know what? I think I do want to hold the office of a bishop. I do want to do that. I do want to make a difference. I do think I can do this. And I, I was deemed qualified and everything else, you know, like that, that this was something that, that the direction that I was making and deciding for my personal life as someone who was just a layman in the church, someone who was just trying to be a good Christian to say, here's the next step that I want to make. And I'm going to do this because I think this is what God wants me to do. I think this is something that God has for me to do. So when I made that decision, I came to that decision first based on the Bible. Why would in the world did I think that God wanted me to do that? Because the Bible says, he that desireth the office of a bishop desireth, desireth a good thing. That that is a good thing. If you, if you want to do that, that's a good thing. So I already knew it's a good thing. I know that God uses pastors and teachers and stuff to, for the edifying of the saints. And you know, there's a good purpose for that. There's a good role. I know that this is something that God would want me to do. There's so many things that God doesn't want me to do, but this is one that I could be pretty confident of looking at the scripture. God wants me to do this, okay? So making that decision first, just based on God's word, is, is where the faith starts. And, and we looked at different areas now, because that was the first thing is just, am I going to do this? Yes, okay, okay, yes. Now the decision's made. I'm going to pastor a church somewhere. I'm going to dedicate my life to serving the Lord in this capacity of, of, of being a pastor of a church. So now the rest of it's kind of, I want to say inconsequential, but like the, the rest of the decisions you make from that point are all fall under the, the, main, the main direction, the main, point, the, the main focal point of just this is what, what I'm going to do. So we looked at different areas. We shopped around for a house when we decided on, on Prescott Valley. And we looked around and um, got all that stuff settled. And even looking back after everything happened, the way that it all worked out was just amazing. And it, and it was apparent to me how much God had his hand in us starting a church up here. And I was just talking to my wife about this the other day because it's easy sometimes to forget about that. And especially when things are going rough and when there's low attendances and things like that, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people here, you start to question and doubt, but then it's like, you know what, no. I remember finding our house. I remember the price point. I remember everything about getting started. And when I look back, I'm like, there's no way that everything that happened happened all by coincidence to get us here. There's no way. I don't believe that. I don't, buy, I don't believe in these, these types of coincidences, especially when there's so many of them all stacked up together. God was all for this decision. God was all for me starting a church here. And I think he still is. And I'm not going to let any other circumstances, you know, sway me on that. I know that he had his hand in this. But after we did all that, then I figured out how my job was going to work out. Why? Because I'm making my decision based on my priorities. Do I really think that God wants me to do this? Yes or no? If the answer is yes... My job comes second. Everything else is going to come second. I'm going to figure out how it's all going to play into that. 
to that most important decision. Regardless of the outcome of my job, I was going to start a church. Now, thankfully, I was able to keep that job when I moved up here. And great, by the grace of God, I was able to, to maintain that so that that wasn't a concern of mine of supporting my family and being here to start a church. But I didn't get that settled first, I'll tell you that much. I didn't go and, and ask my boss, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you, th you know, like, like, will I still have my job and then go and do everything else for the, for the church? No, I actually, I think we already put our money down on the house and did everything else. And then I was like, hey, I'm planning on moving up here. Can, you know, can I still keep my job? And the reason why I bring this up is because the decision was made on faith. Knowing that if this is something that God wants me to do, he will, he will provide for me. He will make it work. I'm going to rely on God to make this work. God, this is where you want me to be. This is what you want me to do. I'm going to work for you. I'm going to serve you. You have to make this work somehow. And there's nothing wrong with having that attitude with God. We see people having that type of attitude all, all throughout the Bible. Of just saying, God, I need, I need you. You need to work this out because I can't do all this stuff. God, I want to serve you, but I can't figure everything out. And interestingly enough, which is one of the reasons why I'm even preaching about this, is I find myself in another position right now. So for those of you who have been wondering, you know, why did Pastor Burson shave off his beard? Right? And this is a big thing. I posted a picture up on Facebook yesterday of just... You know, clean shaven. It's his first time in like eight years, I think, at least. We're, we're trying to figure it out with my wife and I. We've been married for almost 10 years. And almost uh, our whole marriage, I've had a beard. And my kids don't like it. They're, they've, never, they've never seen me without a beard except in a couple, like, wedding pictures. But um, the reason why I don't have my beard is because I need to go on job interviews. And I need to find another job. I was laid off from my job on Friday. So to me, it was a no-brainer because I already know there's people out there that they don't like beards and they might, you know, first impressions make a big deal. So you go to places, some jobs won't let you have a beard. They want, you know, for whatever reason, they have their standards and it is what it is. And to me, getting a job is more important than having a beard. So I made the decision. I'm just going, okay, I'm just going to do this. Now, I have full confidence and faith in God that he will allow me to keep pastoring this church and find me some other work that I could, because I have to provide for my family. And this is where the balance comes in, and, and I think this is very important that we understand this. It is extremely important for me as a father of my children, as a husband to my wife, to provide for my family. And the Bible says if I don't provide for my own, I'm worse than an infidel. I'm worse than an unbeliever. So very strong language. Yes, that's a priority. Yes, I have to make sure that gets done. But you know what else is a priority? This church and being a pastor and serving God. Serving God is actually, you know, my walk with God, my, my relationship with God is a more important priority even than my family. That is a priority I make. So, so that, is, that has to come first. Now, my family is, is, is next. So I'm not sitting here saying, well, I've got faith and God's just going to provide for me and then I'm just going to like do nothing at home and be like, sweet, I'm on vacation now. That's not how it works. Because I know that, you know, I need to provide for my own, guess what? I'm going to be looking for a job aggressively until I find another one. But what, but what I'm going to be doing is saying, God, I'm going to do the best that I can do. I'm still going to serve you. Just because I got laid off from my job doesn't mean I'm going to stop serving the Lord. I went out soul winning this afternoon. Guess what? I'm still continuing the challenge. Yesterday, I, I tried to preach the gospel to somebody. That's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. 
I'm not going to put that off to the side because I need to find a job. Now, do I need to find a job? Yeah. Is that going to take over other priorities? Sure. It's going to supersede other things in my life, but not what I'm doing here. And I have the faith that God will provide for me. I'm not worried about that one bit. And the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because as a pastor, I'm supposed to be able to lead by example. So I don't just tell you to go soul winning. I'm going to go soul winning. I don't just tell you to go off and do something else and be involved in this or be involved in that. And I'm not going to do it too. So if I'm going to tell you that, hey, you need to live your life based on faith and you need to be able to make these decisions and you can say, oh, well, pastor, you don't know anything about that. I mean, yeah, it's real easy for you. You've got this nice job and you're working out with everything, but, but I'm the one that has to provide for my family. Well, guess what? Right now I have to provide for my family and I need to find a job. But you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to let that interrupt. Get, you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to take a job that's going to get me out of church on Wednesday. I'm not going to cancel Wednesday night Bible study because now I need to work. This church is still going to continue to operate and do what needs to be done. And I'm going to rely on God to be able to do it to where I can still keep doing everything. You're in Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse number 24. The Bible says, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? This is a great teaching. And, and we're going to continue on here with everything that Jesus said, but put your life in perspective. While I know I have to provide for my family, do I have to provide multiple vehicles, a hot tub, you know, all, just, just all kinds of, you know, a huge house, air conditioning, all these other things, all, you know, brand new clothing, brand new shoes, brand new this, brand new that, TV, DVDs, you know, whatever, all the stuff that just, just people have gone so accustomed to. Is that what life's all about? Do I have to do all that to provide for my family? Because I, I don't think we need that. Does my family need to be clothed and fed? Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm going to put a house, I'm going to put a roof over their head too. You know, we're going to be sheltered. I'm going to protect my family. But there's many ways that we can do that. Now, I thank God that he's blessed us enough already. I mean, we, he's really blessed us. We've got, we, we've got more than, 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 in my opinion, imaginable. It's, 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 it's incredibly nice what, what God has done for us. But we need to receive these words and realize he's, what he's saying here. He's saying you don't need to, to take thought about this stuff and worry about it and we haven't even had to worry about what are we going to eat and drink because we've been blessed so abundantly. But what he's saying, and it's, and it's, you know, we don't have to worry about even eating and drinking ultimately because God knows that we need these things. He says the life is more than just meat and the body than raiment. And he's going to continue on to say that it's not that no one ever has to think about food and clothing, but what he wants us to do is to focus on serving God and then he'll provide it for you. So let's get to that, that context here. In verse number 26, the Bible says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And he brings up their faith. He's saying, you know, do you not even have enough faith? You can see all around you how God deals with his creation, how he deals with the birds, how he deals with the grass. How he, you know, he's providing for all of this stuff. He provides. And you don't even have enough faith to trust that God will provide for you? 
Verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. While I am, there's a level of concern because I'm responsible for my family over being able to provide for them. I'm really not worried about it, especially if I'm going to be listening to the words of Jesus here. And he's saying, you don't have to fret over this stuff and worry about that. And, and here's why. The reason why he's bringing this up is because there are so many people that get so caught up in this and worried about that, that they end up spending way more of their time devoted to just making money than they are to serving God. And that that ends up becoming more important to them than seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and letting God then add these things unto you. Because it was so foolish for us to think, yeah, I know God knows, look, God in heaven knows I need to provide for my family. He knows we need to be clothed and fed. Which is why I can trust that they will be clothed and fed. He knows it. And as long as I'm going to continue to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, as long as I keep working, he will be providing. And especially when I'm working at the things that I know he wants me to do. I know is his will. I know that God wants me preaching the gospel. I know that he wants me in his word. I know he wants me teaching. I know he wants me doing these things. I don't have to know right now how God is going to provide for me. I don't know. But I'm going to make my decisions now based on principles. And my principle is I do need to provide for my family. So I am going to be, believe me, looking for a job. I'm not just going to sit back and not do anything about it. But I'm not going to retract anything that I'm in my service to the Lord. That's still first. That still is first and foremost. Making sure I'm here in church is first and foremost. Making sure I'm going soul winning is first and foremost. Making sure I'm reading my Bible and teaching my family and doing everything I know that God wants me to do is first. And then I get the job. And this is walking by faith. I don't know where the job's going to come from, but I know it's going to come. I know it is. I'm not, I, I'm not even worried about that. The only time I'd have to worry about that is if, is if I was worried about being chastised by God because I'm in some horrible sin or something and God is just bringing down some stern discipline on me. But I can tell you honestly right now, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case. It would be a different story if, if I was like, yeah, you know what, I'm like really off into some, you know, into some hidden sin that no one knows about and that now I'm being chastised. I don't think that's the case here. Go back, if you would, to Hebrews 11, because we're going to see these examples of all of the things that God was saying for these people to do. Oh, and, and on that same point, you know, I had this in a different point. In my, before you go back to Hebrews 11, turn, if you would, just Luke chapter 10 real quick. Just back on the same concept of Put it, making priorities and, and what's important and, and how we ought to make our decisions and, and what's going to be right for us to do. We see an example in Luke chapter 10 of Martha. Martha and Mary and Jesus goes into their house and he's teaching. And Martha is someone who's worried about getting work done, about doing stuff that's there. And hey, Good. I love, you know, I love people that like to work hard. That's a good attribute to have and to be concerned about working and stuff. But there comes a point where we need to take a step back and say, am I letting this get in the way of what I really should be doing? Luke chapter 10, verse number 38. 
The Bible says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Martha gets a little bit of a rebuke here because it wasn't a bad thing that she was serving, right? She had guests in her house and she was serving. But you know what was more important? was taking a break from that and listening to Jesus. That's what Mary decided to do. Hey, the Messiah is here. The Christ is here. Let's, let's listen to what he has to say. The dishes could be done another time. Now, the dishes are going to need to be done, but not then. Not when Jesus is there. And I would, go, I, would, I would use this same type of thing to say, work needs to be done. Work doesn't need to be done while we're, while we're meeting at church. There's some things that are more needful than others. The Bible, you know, Jesus said when Satan was trying to tempt him with food, right, with, with hey, make this turn the stone into bread and eat it. Well, is bread a necessity to live? Of course it is. We need, we, need, we need to have food in order to survive. So he's tempting him with something. He says, hey, this is, this is vital. This is important. Hey, why don't you make this, this stone into bread and eat? You know, you're hungry. You've been fasting for so long. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And in multiple places, we see that, that importance given to, you know, giving priority to God and his word and in that service over the things that we know are necessities, being clothed and being fed. And that's why, as we saw in Matthew, that we shouldn't be so worried or concerned about those things, even though it may be a responsibility for the men. Yes, it's a responsibility, and you, need, you, you do need to make sure it's taken care of, but we need to trust and have the faith that God will provide. And we just need to be willing to work, and, and we need to serve him first. We serve him first, the rest will fall into place. And it will fall into place. And that's why I'm so confident tonight that it's going to fall into place for us. And I actually think that it's going to be even better than it, than it has been. But that's, that's actually a whole other sermon I'm going to plan on preaching next week. But let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's see the examples of these people in Scripture that made decision, that made hard decisions. And we're going to be pausing through some of these and seeing how, how difficult we might think a decision like this might be or how drastic it might be, how life-altering it is. But they made the decision based on faith. And it wasn't some random faith or something that they just came up with in their own heart. In every single instance, the faith was something that God had said that they needed to do. Now you say, well, God's not talking to me today. Yeah, I know. I mean, he's not going to talk to you audibly. He's not going to talk to you the same way that he talked to Abraham or to Noah. But he does talk to you right here. We have instructions from him. So if we are going to follow God's instructions, we do need to follow them by faith and trust that no matter what the circumstance, he's going to take care of us. This is, I, brought, I think I brought this up last week, but it's the same reason why you know, I'm not worried at this soul winning conference that's coming up you know, what neighborhood we go into. I'm not worried about soul winning in the worst ghetto. I'm not worried about it. Why? Because if I'm serving the Lord and doing what He wants me to do and going to the poor and going to the maimed and going to the fatherless and the widows and going into the areas where nobody wants to go because they say it's a slum or because they say it's dangerous or whatever, then I know if I'm doing God's work that He is able to, to deliver me. He's able to keep me safe. He's able to protect me. Why, why, is that foolishness? No, that's faith. Now, the... the the world's going to look at that and say, well, that's foolish. 
But I don't care what the world thinks. Because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And the reason why I can have faith in that is because how many scriptures do we need that say that God is our shield? God's, read the book of Psalms. Okay? No matter how many people we have enemies surrounding us, God's going to see us through. We're serving the Lord. God's going to deliver. We just talked about this morning, Goliath, David and Goliath. All the odds completely stacked against David. But what did God do? He delivered David. Why? Because he was doing his work, because he came in the name of the Lord, because he was there to, to bring the victory that, where all the credit goes to God, where, where God is the one who does the, the, the victory, but David is willing to stand up and do the work. Do the job that no one else wanted to do. So if I'm willing to, to do the job that no one else is willing to do and go into the ghetto, you know what? God's going to protect me. Unless he has some other plan of where he wants me to be, then I have nothing to worry about. And I still have nothing to worry about. Either way, there's, there's, there's no cause for, for concern. There really isn't. And I'll tell you what. That's a great feeling to have, by the way. It, it's like uh, if you could remember back far enough, and, and just recently I was able to do this, try to get inside the mind that you had, at least if you had a good household or good parents, of the way that you would feel like when your mom would, would like rock you to sleep or something, you know, when you're like real young, and that sense of security of just like no cares, no problems, mom's here, or dad's here, who, you know, whoever is just, just completely comforting. It's only you. That's the feeling that we have with God, or you can have. Because when you know when you're, when you're being a good son, when you're serving him the way you ought to do, and I could just be like, hey, I, can, you know, I could go anywhere. I could go to the worst part of the world, and I know that I could be protected. And that God could have legions of angels keeping the path safe. If that's his will, and, and, and if his will would be that something else would happen, well, then I'm still going to glory that it's, it's God's will, that, that I'm doing something that he wants to have done that's going to, in one way or another, still bring more honor and glory to his name and get, and get his, his work done. Whether or not I'm able to understand why at the time or not. There's a lot of things that the Apostle Paul went through that I'm sure he didn't understand why he went through them at the time and then was able to look back later and be like, oh, wow, this happened, this happened, this happened. The, the, when Stephen was martyred, I believe that that was also another, that thing, that's something that we can see from Scripture because that was Saul, before he got saved and became Paul, witnessed his death. And that impact, that, that the death that Stephen had upon Saul was probably instrumental in his getting saved and then doing the work that he did. So Stephen had to, had to be able to you know, be willing to sacrifice his life in service to God in order for so much more work to even be done that, that the Apostle Paul was able to do. And, you know, there's so many ways that we just look at this and be like, it's incredible. And, 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 and then Stephen, on top of all that, he's going to get who knows how many rewards for being faithful unto death and, and to be martyred for the cause of Christ, you just pile them on. And he's got an inheritance in heaven that's, that's not fading away and that's sure. And I don't think he would trade that in to have decided to, well, no, I, I would have rather been really successful in business. It's so stupid. I mean, really think about it on the big scale. And that's what we have to do to think by faith is to put it on the proper scale and think that what does it really matter? What you do, what does it really matter? I try to think of the ways, how much can I do, how little of the things that don't really matter can I do so that I can focus on the things that really do matter? That's what I want to maximize. That, that ratio of, of things that matter to things that don't matter. Let's look at these examples. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 7, the Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, remember faith is the evidence of things not seen, moved with fear, 
prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So God warned Noah and said he was going to destroy the world. And he said it was going to be a flood. He didn't see it. The only way he knew it was coming was based on God's word. But what did he do? He acted on it. He acted on that faith of believing God when God said something and turned that into action in his life by literally, physically devoting his time now to building an ark because he says, I don't have to see any of the signs. I don't need the scientists to tell me that there's going to be this disaster coming. I'm not going to rely on any of that. I'm going to believe God and I'm going to be protected and safe. And I'm going to put that into action. I'm going to work that way. And that's what he did. He built an ark when other people were probably ridiculing him and mocking him for, what are you doing, Noah? <laughs> why, why are you building this ark on your property? Like, why, why, what, how are you going to get it down to the sea? You know, like, what are, what are you doing with this here? Nope, there's going to be, there's going to be a, a flood. There's going to be a disaster. And he acted on that faith. And he was living by faith. Look, look at Abraham, verse number eight. By faith, Abraham, when he was called... To, and, and, you know, before we move on, think about how much time that would require for Noah to invest in order to build this ark. And he, he, you know what? He still had to provide for his family. He had to work at building the ark while he was still providing for his family. But he made it a priority to make sure that ark got built because we know it did get built and it got built in time. Verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. And to me, this is like some of the biggest faith that I can find is with Abraham. Are you being called out? Be like, I don't even know where I'm going. God just said, okay, I'm calling you out. Where am I going? Well, I'll let you know when you get there. Right? I'm going to send you out to a land, you know, I'm promising you this land, and, and it's going to be great. All right, let's go. Leaving his security of his house and, and you know, being, being comfortable with, with whatever he's, however he's sustaining himself. You know, whether it be fields and crops and animals or, what, you know, whatever he's doing to, to sustain himself. Nope, he was called to go, and you know what he did? He went. To receive an inheritance, he obeyed. Verse number nine, by faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. He didn't have a house. He was, he was living in a tent. He was camping. He was camping out for like the rest of his life, basically. He's just out there and, uh, and, and living out of tents. Why? Because God told him to. And he acted on that, on that through faith. But this is key, verse number 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations whose building and maker is God. He cared more about the things that are not seen than the things that are seen. He, he was making his decisions based on the eternal, not the temporal. He was making his decisions based saying, you know what, I, I know there's more than this. So who cares if I leave my hometown? Who cares if I leave this stuff behind because it's all going to be burned up anyways. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to be focused on that eternal city. I'm going to be focused on the things in heaven. Great. And when you can have this mindset, it, it really does relieve a lot of stress, <laughs> believe it or not. It really does. Where you could say, this is what I'm focused on. Everything else will fall into place because I'm going to do what God told me to do. Verse number 11, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Sarah was old. She didn't have the strength to conceive seed. She was very old when she did conceive and bear Isaac. But through the faith, knowing that if God's going to tell you, saying God's not going to harm her or hurt her like like, this is of God, her receiving that seed and, and, and having a child. She was strengthened 
to be able to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She didn't have to worry about having a miscarriage. Why? Because God promised. She didn't have to worry about her being 90 years old because God promised. And he, she judged him faithful. Well, he's faithful. God doesn't lie. So I could just it, trust in that. Didn't have to worry about being able to, to physically even be able to, to nurse the child at that age. And, you know, and it's past the time of women with her. Doesn't have to worry about that. Why? Because God promised. Verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. So they were given promises, and they didn't even receive them. And they died. They didn't even get them yet, but they lived their life according to the promises. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. My friends, this is the attitude we need to have. Let's not get so rooted into this world and what this world offers and just, and just so entrenched into living our life just based on the things of this world because we need to be able to open up and allow uncomfortableness to happen in order to do what's right, in order to step by faith and by real faith based on the things that God said, not just some imaginary faith of, you know, some people will say, oh, I bought, you know, they, they buy things that are way out of their price range and this is one of the examples I was trying to think of earlier, but now I just thought of it, you know, like, like I'm going to go buy a yacht. Don't you, you have the money for that. I know I don't have the money for that, but I'm going to take a leap of faith. I'm going to buy it, and you know what? God's just going to cover the rest. I just know that he wants me to buy a yacht. I just, it's going to happen. And this is the way the stupid uh, Tony Robbins type crowd and, the, you know, the, the self-help people and the motivational speakers will tell you, you know, you got to make a void in your life and then it'll just get filled. And it's like, yeah, make a void in your life like credit card debt given to them to tell you that you need to, to make more voids in your life. Sorry. <laughs> that's not faith. Or at least that's, that's a foolish faith because it's not based on God's word. The faith that we're talking about is faith based on something that God said, something that God promised, something that God said he's going to do. Let's jump down here, verse number 17. The Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And again, I mean, we're talking about Abraham with the faith. First, he tells them just to leave and just go somewhere where he didn't know where he was going. Go to somewhere you've never been before and just pick up and go. That's faith. And then, the son that he was promised, the son that he received miraculously in his old age, now he says, hey, I want you to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. It's great to read these stories and to kind of get motivated by them, but spend the time to make it real, to put yourself in Abraham's shoes. And especially when you have children of your own, to think about what type of choice that might be if God were to say, hey, I want you to offer up your son. That's pretty serious. But as I mentioned before, the comfort in being able to trust so completely in God that he's not going to steer you wrong, that he will take care of you, is such a great feeling that to even be able to do something like this just shows that you do really have, you know, Abraham really did have a lot of faith. And here's why. Because he knew that God was faithful. And he had no doubt about that. He was, he was confident, you know what, God is faithful. So God's not going to tell me to do something that is, is wicked. God's not going to tell me to do anything that is, um, you know, that's going to put him in a bad spot. Or, you know, I mean, anything that God tells him to do, he said, well, God knows better than I do, so I'm going to listen to God. And he had so much faith here, it says, and um, let's read verse 17 again. By faith, Abraham, when he tried, offered up Isaac, 
And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting, this is why he did that. This is why he was able to, to, to offer up Isaac and be willing to go through with that sacrifice, which we know pictured the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of the Father in heaven, right? That, that that was symbolic of all of this. I'm sure Abraham probably wasn't necessarily fully aware of that illustration, but here's what he did know. It says in verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. He knew that whatever reason God had him doing this stuff, and maybe he did know that that's what it was representing. I don't know. Whether he knew that or not, what he did know for sure is that he knew that God was able to raise up his son from the dead, that, that if God's having me to do this, he already made promises that in Isaac shall a seed be called, and that through Isaac, all the blessings that God already covenanted with Abraham about, that he was, that he was, that's how he's going to receive them was through Isaac. So if he's telling me to kill him, well, I know he's not going to go back on his word. So whatever I do here, somehow God's just going to make it work again and make it, and make it right. And that God can, God can easily bring him back from the dead like that. Accounting that God of God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. That's faith. It's knowing clearly what God said and being able to act on it and trust in it and just do it because it's what God wanted them to do. Verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. He was able to prophesy things of the future. Why? Because God revealed that unto him, so he was able to bless them accordingly. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Why? Because he lived by faith. Because he knew, hey, if God said this, it's going to happen. And so he already, he made plans based on something that was going to happen way in the future. Because God said so. We should be making plans now with the decisions that we make in our life based on things that are going to happen way in the future. Like the millennial reign of Christ. When's that going to happen? I don't know. I don't. I don't know when that's going to happen. But when it does, I want to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ and be, get, be given, you know, a bunch of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And you know what? I'm going to give com commandment to my children about these things also. Why? Because I know they're going to happen. Because God said so. It's written in his word, and we're living by faith. And, I'm gonna, and, and, if the, and if the Antichrist doesn't come in my lifetime and Jesus Christ doesn't come back in my lifetime, I'm commanding my kids, guess what? The Bible says it's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. It's going to happen for sure. So you be ready for this to happen in your lifetime. You be ready by walking in the Spirit as much as you can and serving God to, to what, in whatever capacity he's going to have you serving him and, and worry about that. Worry about that more than anything else. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now with Moses, it's interesting because there's multiple things here where his faith is expressed, that his faith is shown. First, we see the faith of his parents. So we're, we're not going to fear what Pharaoh can do because God doesn't want us killing our son. So by faith, they hit him. Like, we're going to do what we can to, to, to keep this child alive because, he, you know, this is, this is of God and, and we're not going to be afraid of what someone else is doing to us to get us to, to sin against God. There's faith right there. Faith under threat of death. Faith under, you know, other threats, but still acting based on that faith. And then by faith, Moses, as when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So Moses has this opportunity to, because of where he grew up in Pharaoh's household, he could be called Pharaoh's son. 
right? And have all the riches and live like the world and have everything at his fingertips, right? Boy, that's kind of a pull. There's a, and, and you know what? That pull is out there today. That's the same pull that the people that get involved in the, you know, the rock stars and, and Hollywood. Oh, I have all this money and, and anything I want to do and I could live this hedonistic lifestyle and I could go out and sleep around and party and do drugs and do this and do that and just have all these pleasures of sin for a season. He had that opportunity. But by faith, Faith in what? In God's word. Faith in, in the Lord, knowing that that's not right. That's not, that is all temporal. That's all going to vanish. That's wicked. He had faith in God, in the Lord, and in his word. To not accept those things, but rather, it was like two polar opposites. Hey, you can either be afflicted, you know, and be like a slave and be afflicted and be beaten, or you can have all the pleasures of the world. He's like, I'm going to take the beating. I'm going to take the affliction. Why? Because he can see past the moment. And that's what we need to be able to do, see past the moment. And you know, applying this to my own life, I need to see past the moment. The moment I could be scared to death, but I'm not. Because I'm looking beyond that moment. Verse number 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He knew there was going to be a reward. He had faith in that. And we know there's going to be a reward for serving God too. But are we prioritizing that? Are we making decisions in our life based on that? That's the question. Verse number 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. So again, a, a, a different instance of his faith was now, hey, there's the wrath of the king upon you. He didn't care. He said, okay. I'm going to forsake Egypt anyways, regardless of how the king thinks about it, no matter what Pharaoh thinks about it. Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And again, another example of faith. What do you hear from God? Hey, I'm going to send a death angel. And this is what you need to do. And anyone who doesn't have the, the, the blood on their doorposts, the firstborn son's going to die. A lot of people in Egypt mocked that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'd like to see that happen. And it did. And they found out the hard way. Moses had the faith to say, I'm not going to call God out on this because he said it, then it's going to happen. So let's kill the lamb, do exactly what he said. Let's put this blood on his doorposts and trust in God. Oddly enough, that saved him. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, although I love it. Hebrews chapter 11, because then it goes on and it just, you know, basically just lists off all the, you know, all the different people. And, and the Bible's even saying, you know, we could go on and on and on about all the people that, that showed their faith by their works, that showed the faith that they had in the way that they lived their life. Let's keep that in mind as you read your Bible this year, as you go through the book, look at all the different ways that people made a change in their life. And these are all regular people. Even Moses was a regular person. David was a regular person. Peter, James, John, all, they were regular people. They were everyday people like you and me. What set them apart? Why do we revere them as heroes of the faith? Because of their faith. Because it wasn't just a faith in word. They didn't just give lip service to God. They actually acted on it. They actually did something about it. Let's let faith define our life and the decisions that we make, all the important decisions. Let's, let's, let's do them based on faith and think, you know, I, I need to, to reevaluate my life. What am I doing right now? Am I where God wants me to be? 
Am I soul winning the way God wants me to be? Am I reading my Bible the way God wants me to be? Am I learning the way God wants me to be? Am I teaching others the way God wants me to be? Am I doing the most that I can do for God? Am I doing what he wants for me to do, what he expects for me to do? So that way when I get to heaven, he can say, well done, that good and faithful servant. And if not, what do I need to do to change that? Is it going to make me uncomfortable? Does it matter? You know, being in this church, I'm going to make you uncomfortable. I, I, I try to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm not sadistic, believe me. But, but I don't think that we should be getting back and coasting through the Christian life. And, and you know what? I need to push myself. So if I'm going to push myself, I'm going to push you too. Because I don't want to get comfortable. I don't want to get laid back. I don't want to get, eh, it's all right, you know, I, I fall into the, just some, some old routine. I don't want to do that. That's why we do the challenges. And, and when I could think of enough challenges, we'll probably have a challenge every month of the year. <laughs> we haven't done that yet. I just started them last year, but, but don't worry, I'm working on it. So those months where you think you're coasting, we're not going to coast. I don't want to coast. I want to improve. I want to do more. I don't want you to get burned out, but I want you to act on faith. I want, I want you to, to have the comfort in, in Christ and the comfort in, in knowing that if you're doing right, God's going to take care of you. And, and, and having that comfort will, will actually help you not to get burned out because you just, hey, man, we're, we're, doing, we're doing what's right. Join me in my zeal. Let's do some good things for God. Let's, let's act on it. <laughs> let's be an Acts 29 church. <laughs> we were talking about that before church, right? No, let's, let's be a church that could be worthy to be like included in the book of Acts, that, that we're doing the works because we care, because we're sold out to serve the Lord, because we're zealous, because we're going we're gonna to act by faith and not by sight, and, and we're going to do these things. We're going to have action. Let's do that. Let's do that together as a church. Let's grow. Let's push forward. And let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the encouragement we could get and, and the, the great examples of people who walk by faith in, in Hebrews and Hebrews 11, dear Lord, and um, just all throughout the Bible. What great examples they are, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be able to um, exhibit the same type of faith in our lives. And knowing that the more we can walk by our faith, the more impact it will have on other people as well. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to help the, the, the end goal that much more when people can see our faith while we're going out and trying to, to preach the gospel to every creature that, that anyone who, who knows us can see a separated people, people who are, who are set apart in, in service to God and who make decisions that some people may think are crazy but that we know are just in accordance with trying to do more to serve you. God, we ask for your blessing upon us and help us to, to be strengthened and comforted through the Holy Ghost in order to make the right decisions and to stay focused on the eternal and not on the temporal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.